You all right to talk about that? When I was getting taken to hospital after the stabbing, and my mum was on duty as a casualty nurse in Lewisham Hospital, and she had to get taken to the side and told, look, your son's, you're gonna to have to come off duty because your son's coming in. He's coming in as a DOA, dead on arrival. Um, I, I just broke down. Tony, how are you, brother? Good. Nice to meet you, Chris. Yes, it is. It, well, it's it's the joys of podcasting, mate, as I, I get to meet some amazing people, um, all of whom have been just wonderful individuals. And, um, mate, it's not by getting paid to chat, is it? I can think of worse things. We, we've been in worse situations, haven't we? Yeah, it's like... Uh, Imagine if they had podcasts in back when we asked, had to do guard duty. <laughs> we, we could have knocked out loads. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as I, I was saying yeah. to you before, mate, yeah. I, I, um, all, a lot of our audience love all things military. There's, there's um, God, we could, there's loads there we could chat, chat about alone. But I think you and I both... In fact, as I'm rapidly learning, I, I almost think everyone in society suffers from some form of trauma. I think it's the nature of the society we're in that seeks to frighten us all the time, that seeks to um, just instill fear through the media. We've got this culture of, you know, making people feel bad about themselves through the beauty and the health magazines and the plastic surgery and the um, and, and, and this kind of thing. So I, I, I'm sort of gr getting my head around the fact I think all of us, everyone has some sort of trauma, right? But I know that you in particular, you went through quite a serious incident. I know because I was just listening to a bit of it. Are you all right to talk about that? Absolutely, yeah. It, it's um, it's a funny one because I've I say I've spoke about it quite a bit in the past, but only you know after a couple of beers and if anyone's asked about it, but it was never really addressed at the time, um, and I never sort of spoke to anyone or had any help with it afterwards, and it's only in in recent times where I'm starting to feel the effects. And there, there's no, there, there's no timings for these things. You know, it, it, there's no say on, on if it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. Um, and yeah, it's only in recent years that it's kind of started to catch up with me. And it was only a few months back where um, I was, you know, talking to the wife about it because I was preparing actually for that show with, um, with Jamie on the No Excuse Excuses podcast. Mm. I was just talking through things and making sure that it's clear in my head um, and just broke down. It, it was at the point where I was talking about when I was getting taken to hospital after the stabbing and my mum was on duty as a casualty nurse in Lewisham Hospital and she had to get taken to the side and told, look, your son's, you're going to have to come off duty because your son's coming in. He's coming in as a DOA, dead on arrival. Um, and you're going to have to come off duty for obvious reasons. Talking about the stabbing, the knife entering, the fight, this, that and the other, I'm fairly okay with. But once I got to that bit and you start thinking about other people's emotions and how horrendous it must have been for them, um, I, I just broke down. And it just came from nowhere after, what, you know, 20 plus years. Um. But yeah, sorry, to, to, I, I'm okay talking about it. It, it. It's just that's 
a, a particular point that, that now kind of sticks in my head that it's quite funny that I've been okay talking about it. And there was that one incident where it was like, ah, okay, maybe, maybe there is something that needs to be addressed here. The reason I mention it, mate, is <sighs> it's like this, right? Everyone says to me, I, I wrote a book called Eating Smoke. It was my first memoir, right? It pretty much covers how after the Marines, I completely lost my mental health in Hong Kong, right? Chronically addicted to crystal methamphetamine um, without, you know, kicking the arse out of it. It, it, it. it was all the ramifications of an upset childhood were coming back and I, and I was having to deal with them for the first time in my life, coming out the secure environment environment of the military where everything's looked after for you i'm there i'm alone in hong kong things are starting to go wrong i'm relying on this drug more and more to you know i'm thinking it's great and it's making me happy blah blah but it's it, it, it's the same the, the same story of addiction we we've all heard many many times especially with veterans um and ended up with my parents back in the UK being told, right, he needs to go. In fact, before that, mate, going back to the, the crying incident, in, in my head, I was so mentally unwell. I thought the commando crawl that we were taught to get across the, the rope, across the canyon, I, I got it into my head that I had to crawl from my tenement building across a wire that went to the building on the opposite side of the Jaffe Road in Hong Kong, right? So I'm 70 metres above ground doing the old commando thing, right? And I stopped and I suddenly thought of my brother and I suddenly thought of like how much we loved each other, you know? He's my, my best mate. We went through all this shit as kids together, you know? We went to one primary school where they had a rule that the big kids had to be in the big kids playground and the little kids were in the little and you weren't allowed to like interact. Well, we're going through a massive divorce. It's like my parents have been separated about f three times already. We're at a school at the other end of the country, 300 miles away from our home. All the, all the usual shit, new school. And I went to, I think six schools new school, new set of bullies, you got to fight, you know, all, all this stuff. And it was like, no fuck is going to stop me seeing my kid brother, you know, no one. So there were steps in between the play. God, I'm getting emotional now. There were steps in between the playground. My brother used to sit on one and I'd sit on the next one. And it, it just felt, it, it felt better, you know, it just, everything just felt better with him there right so when I'm crawling across this cable the thing that made me come to my senses even though I was in, in deep in clinical psychosis was hang on a sec what, why am I doing this I don't have to prove fuck all to anyone only my my kid brother who I love more than anything else in the world you know um and it's still brings me to tears mate now you know this is 20 years ago that 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 powerful connection with someone that love um that you you there's words can't just you can't put into words can you you know and it, just to just to finish the point tony sorry i, I it, yeah no 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 it, it's just that people ask me now oh chris was writing eating smoke therapeutic i'm like what regurgitating something that happened 20 years ago that my mind should probably have long since forgot or compartmentalized or stowed away you know in some memory compartment and then I wrote about it and now I have to talk about it basically every single day um that's why I ask you if you're okay talking about it because I'm constantly regurgitating that trauma right and I I don't mind, but I do wonder if like my life should have moved on, mate, you know, whether I'm maybe not doing myself any favours um, just to sell a few books and, you know, have an interesting podcast. Um, yeah, o o over to you, mate. Any, do you got any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I, well, we're still, I'm still working it out as, as you are. Um, and, and I think, you know, most people are, I think everyone is really on, on that type of subject. Um, I don't think anyone's got it fully figured out. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a waste of time. Uh, there, there is something to be said with not living in the past and moving forward. But the sense that I get with what you've just said there is you're not living in the past. You're not, not moving forward. You're using it to move forward, mm. which is great because a lot of the time, the best leverage we've got to be able to get ourselves to do something or to better ourselves or to change, to affect change, the best leverage we have usually is something external from ourselves. It, it, a lot of people, when they struggle to, to change and, and they think to themselves, I, I, I want to change because, you know, I, I, I need to, I, I feel I must. And they struggle with it because they're telling themselves that that's the right thing to do. They'll be a better person. But as soon as they start thinking about someone else, so if, for example, the reason they need to change is because they're acting in a particular way that's affecting their family, um, and it's not a nice home environment through the way that they're dealing with things for their, you know, their, their wife, their husband, their, their children, as soon as they start thinking about other people, then that creates a bit more leverage for them to be able to move forward and say, okay, right, enough's enough. Um, it's just strange, isn't it, how human beings work? We, we, we've got more chance of changing the way we are if we think about how it's affecting someone else than it does ourselves, mm. you know? So, yeah, to, to answer your question, I. I, I, I don't I haven't got it figured out I don't think anyone really has but um yeah as, as long as it's being used as leverage for something good and for you to be moving forward and it's something that that you ultimately can go to bed at night and you know uh, uh, and be happy with then it's all good in my eyes yeah yeah if that makes sense, I haven't gone off on a tangent too much, have I? Mate, you're brilliant. This is all stuff, let's be honest. I, I say this quite a lot. Like my parents' generation would never be having this conversation. Oh, no way. This would yeah. be lift up the carpet, sweep it all under, pretend yeah. it doesn't happen, go and try and be middle class because then you'll be good. <laughs> you know, that short synopsis there. But, you know, all that was good for them didn't really help the offspring to make sense of this very complex world which shouldn't be as complex as it is because the rules I know you you found the, the simple rules to life they're actually really bloody simple smile do a bit of moderate exercise eat well be nice to people oh and be grateful that we've got this beautiful chance in this amazing experiment because it's incredible um and turn off mainstream media, folks. But that, let's let's not go there. <laughs> too much. It's too much, isn't it? You know. And I think it's quite funny. I'm I'm a I'm a big believer in in balance, and you know everything in moderation and uh, and being balanced with with stuff. Mm. And something I thought of recently is, as as much as people might think that. You know, military guys, especially in, you know, in certain roles, uh, have got it quite hard with the things that have been seen and experienced. Well, actually, that's, I think, balanced out with, with the training. Because something that just keeps rebounding around my head whenever sort of I'm, I'm having a, a down day, just to get perspective on things, is to simplify it. And it goes back to that old saying that anyone that served in the military will know is do the basics well. You know, that's all that needs to be done. And it goes across so many different genres, doesn't it? So, you know, you look at an Olympian, you, you look at and you look at anyone who's highly successful in their, their career or in their life. Not everything has to be monetized or in business terms, but 
you know, success has got lots of different reasons, but anyone who's successful in whatever it may be, they do the basics, but they just do it really well. So that really helps me when it's, oh my God, this is going on. I've got this happening. It's like, right, forget all about that. Just what is close by me? What's the, the closest crocodile to the boat, if you like? What do I actually need to worry about? And, um, and just try and simplify it and, and then go from there. Uh, yeah, big, big believer in that. You know, it's, yeah. there's too many distractions in this world. But if you just try and, and simplify things and look at what's, what is it that I can do? You know, don't try and do things that are out of your control because let's face it, most things are out of our control, aren't they? Yes. I guess it's why Limston is, it's not a bad package, Limston, because everything's planned. You know, do you remember they put the, they put the training program up on the board for the next week and you'll go out. All I ever did was take day, literally day by day. Right. I'm in a fortunate position that I never considered going home ever. It was that, that for me, my home life, I, I, I tried that for 18 years and it wasn't very pleasant. Right. <laughs> um, so I just go and read that orders, right? What am I doing this? What am I doing? I mean, it, to me, it was like, what are we doing today? Or obviously tomorrow, you know, plan a little bit in ahead, right? Six mile speed march. Chris, just pass that fucking thing. Just, you know, head, just, it's gonna hurt. Just, just pass it. And it's, life's different, isn't it? When you run a business and you, you're trying to do the media thing and, and you're trying to run your social, you know, your home life, your family life, your social life, you're trying to get your bloody Instagram posts up and all this kind of stuff. And then the housework's building up and then it's, oh, there's a problem with a car. That's going to take like half a day out of my schedule. I just, I don't really have a but Limston, it's just there for your net. Just as long as you do those things, <laughs> you, 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 you're going to get the end re results so, and don't get injured on the way. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of guys struggle with, isn't it? When they, um, you know, when they leave is what do I do? You know, uh, a lot of guys find that if they haven't got that structure, um, as disciplined as the what's the word you know the perception is you know yes you know it takes a lot of discipline but there's a lot to be said with a lot of disciplined people have actually still got that support there and that guidance and it takes quite a lot of strength and quite a lot of i wouldn't say so much strength but time and understanding and a bit of figuring out you know to to, to sort of find your way through not having someone sort of telling you what to do, not having someone else write out the orders for you. Um, you know, and I think a lot of guys do struggle with that when they first come out. So it's, it's a really good point, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the source of, of quite a few problems, I'm sure. Let's go back, Tony, and just talk, talk about your, you being attacked. Um, something you said just I'm just saying this for the for the record is when I spoke to Simon Weston he was being pushed through the hospital back in the in the UK and obviously was severely um, burned and, and disfigured and the nurse pushed him past his mother and his auntie and his mum looked down at him and went oh you know look at him right and Simon went mum it's me and he and he said he never forget never forget that you know the shock on her her face that 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 rung a bell with what you you just said Tony yeah yeah it, it, it's um yeah, yeah so, sorry yeah so it's not until you think about the feelings of other people really that 
that it sort of starts um, starts cutting you up. We're, we're a lot easier with dealing what happens to ourself. It's like, uh, you know, but it, it, I think it resonates a bit more once you start sort yeah. of so seeing what it's like to other people you love. You stuck up, you stood up to a bully yeah. and smacked him one. And then as you were walking for a shopping centre one day with your mate, his gang, as it were, had block, basically blockaded the shopping centre. Um, you, you, you're there going, hang on, is this about us? Maybe, you, you know, what, what to do? And, and, and you nearly lost your life as a, as, a, as a result of the events that unfolded. Shall we? But I, I didn't know that it, 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 it was for me. Um, so say that again. Sorry, I think we're um, breaking up. We're breaking up there a bit. So, yeah, um, and as a result of this a, a, a attack on you, you got stabbed several several times. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it, it was. Um, yeah, nine nine stab wounds in in, in one sitting. <laughs> um, and it was uh, yeah, it, it was quite a a ferocious attack. And what allowed, what aided in the guy being able to to get nine stab wounds in one go is the there was it, it was a sizable gang and they'd completely surrounded me. Um, so as punches started getting thrown, as they started, you know, attacking, and I was dealing what was coming at me in, from the front, um, you know, the, the guy with a knife was was on my blind side, but it was one of those um, walking canes that had the the sword that where you sort of can pull out the handle and it's got the sword on it. Mm -hmm. Well, it it was the curved handle. So it sort of comes like a, a, a at a right angle, so he could hold it like a like a gun almost. So then he was able to punch it in. So it was, you know, really really quick stabs, starting from. Um, that's a really good question, next or uh, something I haven't thought of. Where did he start? Because it was three stab wounds to the leg on the front of the thigh, three. Um, on the back of the leg, sort of in in the arse area, sort of very close to the lower back, actually, um, and then three wounds up here. And you know, I, I think he was 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 high on something. One memory I've got is the look in his eyes, um, and it was almost just like they were black and very glassy. Uh, so. Afterwards, I, I was told that you know the, most of them were, were were high on on something. Um, so he was rolled up. I, I think he went out. If it wouldn't have been me, it would have been someone else. Um, and yeah, nine nine stab wounds in a matter of seconds, and that was it. Lights out, fell on the floor with that amount of blood flowing out in in one go. Um, I, I hit the deck like a like a sack of bricks. Mate, that must have been, you know, freaking traumatic for the bloody shoppers walking by as well, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, imagine you, you're out in the shopping centre and some gang attacks someone and bloody stabs someone nine times. Um, your, your friend tried... Yeah, to it was during... So yeah, it's uh, we 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 have got a slight delay here. With the, I can hear on my roof the rain coming down, so that's probably not going to help with the signal. Um, but yeah, un unbelievable. The it was sort of midish afternoon, so the shopping centre was packed with with families and mums out shopping. Um, not that just mums do shopping, by the way. It was pa packed with people. Um, <laughs> And 
yeah so my the the one friend that i was with he was uh, dragged away he was maced or cs with, with some kind of um, spray in his eyes and but he stuck around you know there wasn't nothing he could do it happened so quickly there was a lot of them um and yeah he took my belt off and and used it as a tourniquet because he didn't know that the wounds were up here i didn't know that i had wounds up here as well he couldn't see the wounds on the back of the leg um but you know what he he'd done his best and i i defy anyone really at that age that we were to sort of keep as level headed as as he did you know with no training <laughs> um he he stuck by me and and still managed after what must have been a horrific scene because there was a hell of a lot of blood um, people have described it as a river of of blood um and he stuck stuck with me yeah, and still tried to to help the once the ambulance crew turned up they you know they must have felt so bad because one memory i've got is they sort of were really really abrupt who the fuck put this on um because as soon as they saw the wounds above you know the the general rule of thumb with or, or the big rule with a tourniquet is it always goes above where the wound was or where the wound is but he didn't see the other wounds so they quickly took that off um and and also very quickly saw that if we don't move this lead quickly then you know we're, we're going to lose him mm. are you still in touch with that friend absolutely yeah like lifelong friend yeah it, it, um he he was i think he's still dealing with his own stuff with it as well because he was actually um <laughs> Was he arrested? I'm not sure if he was arrested, but he was detained and he was interrogated quite harshly. And I, I've only found this out from him himself over a couple of beers, not that long ago. Mm. Um, and I was like, wow, why didn't you tell me this before? Um, he was interrogated quite harshly. Uh, they, you know, they were trying to, they had to cover all bases and they didn't know, like the police didn't know what, what the score was. Um, so they were going at him, you know, hammer and tongs, you know, you did it, you know who did it, you know, what was your involvement? It must have been horrendous for him. Mm. Jesus, yeah. But yeah, terrified. still still, very good friend. Mm. And the lad that actually yeah. stuck the knife yeah, in, that did, did he get prosecuted? No. No, the... The CCTV camera, it was all caught on CCTV, the whole thing. Uh, but the picture was too grainy. Uh, they couldn't make their faces out. So um, they did manage to track down who'd done it. And they did go to court. They did end up with a day in court. But it got thrown out of court because the CCTV was blurry. And... There, there it is. That you know, just I hope to God that he didn't end up, you know, do, do, doing something similar to someone else or worse. Mm. You know? Yeah, of course. And I heard that you you were always dead set on joining the Marines. Yeah, from as far back as I can remember, it, it, the, uh, you know, joining the military where it was just something that was almost like a calling. Um, I was kind of pushed towards the Marines because once my parents sort of saw, right, OK, um, it looks like we've got one of those cases because <laughs> my first words were military related, you know, I, it just any toys, any clothes, everything had to be military. And it wasn't going away. You know, it, it, it followed me right the way through into my teenage years. So once, once my parents had, had realised what they had on their hands, they were like, right, OK, so we're going to have no choice in this. He's going to join the military. Let's try and sort of, you know, steer him in, in a direction, rightfully or wrongfully. I, I, I don't know. Mm. Um, 
but in a way, I'm, I'm glad they did. And it was what they, the seed that they'd sowed was, if you're going to join the military, go for the Marines. Um, and the, the powers all love this. Um, they said, you know, go for the Marines because they're the best. So if you're going to do it, be the best. <laughs> <laughs> And that just that just stuck in my head. So the Marines, it was. Mm -hmm. You're the opposite of me. I would I never thought about them. Well, I I did as I started to realise I failed all my exams at school. Um, and I joined up for a bet. <laughs> bet with my mate. Bet, <laughs> my mate bet me I couldn't join the Marines. I was like, I, I bloody can. <laughs> um, so brilliant, brilliant. Wake up in Limston like. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, it was well. Yeah, you know, I was a bit of an angry young man. I was not. I don't mean like aggressive, but just you know, things hadn't been good, and I didn't appreciate him telling me what I couldn't couldn't do. And he he just passed the PRC or the PRMC as it is now, um, and and he did make it sound quite wonderful, I have to say, or quite quite adventurous. Um, yes. Yeah, he was. I, I don't want to say the guy's name, but he he was uh, he was on his PRMC with a guy called John, a Welsh chap, uh, who then went on to 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 go SB, and um, just listening to the, the these two buddied up on the PRMC, and from what it, it just sounds like, they both smashed it, you know, and I listened to him telling his story and. And yeah, my mind started thinking then, yeah, I could picture myself doing this. I could do 50 push-ups. I can do the pull-ups. Not sure about the running because it wasn't something I'd done. And then you start reading the recruitment brochures and you're picturing yourself as one of these guys. I when I think like that tone, it gives me the same feeling as, as you know, when I was at, was 17. I just get that feeling again, like I'm excited and, and I can see something here. But um, how how long after this attack then did you did you join? And how long did it take you to recover? And how, how did they keep you alive in the hospital? So. Um, so in, in, in the hospital. It was. I was in the hospital for quite a while. I, I died three times on the operating table. Um, as, as soon as as soon as they got me into casualty, um, and it's it's quite quite vivid memories. You know, I, I was still awake, um, a little bit lightheaded from the loss of blood. But the they had to put a chest drain in. They I can remember. The, the nurse or the doctor, the consultant, whoever it was working on me, had said, um, look, we, we haven't got time for local anaesthetic. And he explained to me the procedure for the chest drain. Um, and I can vividly remember thinking, why are you telling me? Just get on with it. Um, he basically said, look, we've got to put a chest drain in, a, a chest drain in because your, your lungs collapsed. So it's going to help, you know, help, help you breathe. Um, we've got to make an incision in between your ribs here and I'll have to widen it a little bit with my little finger and then we'll put the drain, the, 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 the tube in. I was like, fine, just get it. At that point, I, I must have known, you know, I, I, I was a kind of a, a piece with it. So I can remember not having any fear at all. It really didn't bother me because I thought, well, there's nothing to be worried about because if, if they don't do what they need to do, that's it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm gone. I, I must have felt that I only had minutes left um, because sure enough, as soon as the chest drain went in, I died for the first time. Um, and then it goes to accounts from other people that was there, my older brother, my mum who came in. Um, my mum was holding it together a bit. I can remember, but she was crying, but she was holding it together. When my brother came in, my older brother, he was <coughs> uncontrollably crying. Bless you. He was, 
Excuse me. They come in threes. I'm waiting for the third one. They come in threes, apparently. Hey, you don't get this on the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> but um, he was uncontrollably crying. He could hardly talk. And looking back on it now, you kind of put the pieces together. And my mum had told him, you need to go in there because it's very likely the last time that you're going to be able to see him. And that's the last thing I remember. And then going, so my body was convulsing off of the table. So that was me crashing. Uh, that, that was me dying for the first time. And at a, a rate of knots, they they wheeled me out of the room to, to theatre uh, where I, where they, operated on me because the lung was punctured it had scratched the knife had scratched my heart on the way in um plus obviously i had nine holes on me that they had to attend to and i i died a further two times on the key uh, i was in icu for uh for, for quite a while as well we've um, we paused a bit mate I'm just I thinking know. of the other the oh. other questions so that that happened in the length of time that it took to recover and if i had any help afterwards i didn't have any help afterwards at all mm. there was no psychological help um it took me well i tell you what i'm i'm, I'm still recovering now <laughs> you know the the physical injuries probably took about six months once I'd learned to walk on the leg again, um, because there was quite extensive nerve damage as well that, that was caused. Um, you know, that that was that was one battle. But the like I, you know, I mentioned earlier, the because I didn't have any help with it, it's actually now starting to to affect me more than it did back then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm still recovering, to be honest with you. Um, what was the other question? Well, it 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 don't it it, it doesn't matter too much. This fascinating stuff you're telling me here, mate. Um, I mean, once you've experienced trauma, especially at a young age, it kind of stays with you, doesn't it? You then develop the strategies to to manage it. Um. You know, even when I'm like doing a podcast, there's stuff in my head I'm, I'm having to manage um, because chemicals start flowing. It's it, it, it just affects you on a daily. Well, you know, affects you on a constant sort of basis. Right. Um, the, our connection here, Tony, keeps freezing. I don't know if you're I don't know if you're seeing this. Do, do I seem OK? One second. Sorry, friends at home, we, we're having a bit of a technical glitch. So, yeah, what I was trying to say is trauma is something I think it stays with you. And then as you go through life, you then develop the strategies to kind of deal, you know, to 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 kind of deal with it. Um, um, where, where were you living, Tony? Am I detecting like a London accent? Oh, frozen again. Oh, hang on, you're back. Yeah, yeah. So from from London, you you frozen again. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I might need to. Um, I think I might need to switch my router on and off. Okay, one sec. So again, for our friends at home, just a quick recap, because um, we've had a technical glitch and I'm not sure what you got and what you didn't. And I'll leave this to my producer, Ben, to sort out. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Um, so Tony and I were just saying that Tony was saying he's come into terms, you know, he's having to deal with the post um, traumatic stress of his attack. 
And I was raising the point that, you know, it's hard to know like when you've dealt with it because trauma is something it, it like doesn't go, you know, the files in your brain don't seem to go away. But what we do is we develop the strategies to deal with it. So it doesn't affect our life in a constant downward sort of spiral. Um, and then I was asking you, Tony, where you lived, because the incident you described, and we're a similar age, I'm guessing I'm probably a bit older than you, because I'm older than everybody these days. <laughs> um, but where I live, we had the old, we had, we had a lot of dust ups, we had the football gang that they could do pretty vicious stuff, right? But they, they were like a one off, it was the TCE in Plymouth the central element, right? You, rumor was they'd slash people up with razor baits and stuff. It wasn't very nice. But the incident you described, mate, it, that, that sounds like inner city, you know, young, young men who are not very bloody happy with their lot, um, lacking male role models, possibly. Um, so yeah, that's why that's why I asked where you lived, where where this thing took place. Yeah, so um, London, uh, South London, and it was in in Lewisham, and uh, Lewisham Shopping Centre, okay. and it was Lewisham Hospital I was taken to. Mm -hmm. uh, Lewisham Hospital was where I was born as as well. Funny enough, um, but I don't think that really means anything. But yeah, it's quite, you know. Is that far from Bromley, do you know? Um, not far, yeah. not far. Yeah, Bromley's 15, 20 minutes, well, depending on traffic. Yeah, um, that's, where, yeah. That, that's where I was born. <laughs> oh, okay, so you're, you are from, from yeah. London yourself yeah. then? South East London. Um, it's just we left when I was about four, I think, so I've only got kind of... I remember one time in Bromley... I decided to put oil on the wheels of my tricycle, right? This is how young I was. So I went in the garage and I got a can of petrol out. And I poured this petrol all over my tricycle, right? I'm three years old. And then when my mum found out what I did, she told me that the fire, the fire brigade were coming round to have a word with me. <laughs> if you want to traumatise a three-year-old child, tell them the emergency services are on their way to speak to them right it, it, yes so yes hello hello everyone in Bromley and Lewisham <laughs> um yes so bloody hell your brother's in the hospital he's it must have been I mean that must still affect him to this day I, I'm, I'm sure it does uh, I'm, I'm sure it does because it, it you know, it, it, it can't, it can't be easy. Um, it's really weird, isn't it? Because, you know, I, I and this isn't in a, a bravado way at all. It, it's quite strange, but I, I'm in a way, I'm, I'm glad that I was on, on that side of it. If that makes sense, it's really weird. Um, it's, it's not as much heartache than you know thinking about what's happened to yourself i can't imagine what it would have been like to have been looking down on a loved one that's that's in such a state and and, and about to die and through you know such violent circumstances um it must have been horrendous um uh, they arrested my dad <clears throat> because of his background so he's, my dad's a, a former professional fighter um and he had a bit of a checkered past he got into a bit of the wrong crowd and um, before before i came along um his boxing career was cut short uh, he got into the wrong crowd it was a bit of a name for himself in um in south london and he ended up being quite known to the police so as soon as they put you know the connections together uh, and and found out you know oh 
Jesus, right, we, we best get a handle on this because, you know, we're, they're, they're, bodies are going to start piling up potentially is what they might have been thinking. So as soon as my dad got to the hospital, they, they actually arrested him or detained him um, and said to him, look, it's for your own good, you know, because you're going to do something silly and for the, for the safety of other people, because we know that you're going to go on the war path. Um, <clears throat> so again, yeah, it must have been horrendous for, for everyone all around, really. Mm. I don't feel, uh, do you know what? It must have been horrendous for the guy that done it as well, because no one gets born with a knife in their hand. You know, what sort of life had he had? What was his experiences? You know, what, what caused him to, to get to such a point that, because he was 20, I think he was 20, 21 years old. I was 15 years old at the time. You know, how do you get to such a point that you're an adult and, you know, you stab a, um, stab a, a child effectively almost to death? So that kind of helps me sort of in, 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 recent, in, in recent life, if you like, to, because you, you can't just get angry about it. And it's, it's actually answering a question that someone put out there on from the last podcast that I'd done with Jamie. And someone had said, oh, yeah, I'd love to see an episode two uh, or for Tony to sort of, you know, have another podcast and speak to someone else to find out if he caught up with the bastards that done it. Well, I'd be lying if I'd say there wasn't a time where my mind was in that place. Uh, but I can assure you now, the, the place that my mind's at with, with that in particular is, is not of hate. Um, if, if anything, it's of, of, of sorrow uh, because everyone's got their own story and no one gets born evil, I don't think. Um, and it's all to do with, you know, the chances and the opportunities that, that you have in life. So I can't imagine things were, were, were good for that lad to, to be able to end up in that state. Yes. Massive part of moving forwards is developing empathy, isn't it? To understand situations for what they actually are, not what we perceive they are. And the old school mentality is, no, you got to hate that guy for life. And if you see him, you got to bloody give him and let's get him in. Well, when you understand karma, I reckon, Tony, you know, I'm not talking about karma the way people use it. Like if I steal a Mars bar in a shop, I'm going to go and step in dog shit. Or so, you know, that that's not the way karma works. Karma means if you don't get a good balance in your life, you're constantly going to have experiences that you know it's like I've done so many things in my life um where I thought I was looking for happiness or doing the right thing or or whatever it might be and of course that's why my life's always been so up and down is um I, I I'll tell a little story of a fight I I had if that's okay so on one of my parents numerous, I think they'd finally got divorced. I was living in a place in Cornwall, but my school was in Devon and all the kids in my village, they went to the local school in Cornwall, right? It is co comprehensive now. So we're about 13 or 14. And every day our, our bus would get in, we had to get the local bus home because the you know, all the kids went to the other school. But there's about five of us that would come in on this local bus just as the school bus from the other school came in. And one day we got off the bus and a load of kids got off the, uh, the, the other school's bus and they're like, oh, you fucking wankers. And, and again, angry young man, I'm just turned around like, yeah, you know, fuck off. And my sister's like, Chris, shut up shush i'm like no nah, no one talks to me like that you know and the one guy shouts we'll see you tonight i'm like okay <laughs> right so fast forward to that evening it was about six o'clock 
we're on our estate and it didn't help that our estate was a new estate right we it, it wasn't rich housing or anything but it was a new estate and all these kids came from the council estate up like at the top of the village right and down they come mate it was like a mob it was like something out of like the film Greece or something like you know the gangs <laughs> right? and the big hard lad fortunately had the uh, uh, decency let's say to like stay out of it and just let us two fight and this guy come down the road right you fuck it up bang I just I hit him as hard as I could Tony right and I wasn't a fighter. I'd never, I'd, I'd done a bit of judo, which I was quite good at at school for a year, but I wasn't a boxer or anything. I didn't like look forward to fighting, um, but I knew I had to. It, we were toe to toe and that was it. And I just punched him and shut him up. And then, then he went, right, whoa, stop, stop. I'm going to take my jacket off. <laughs> right. So he, he took his jacket off and he gave it to this big hard, hard geezer. He went, right, okay. And then he hit me, right? And um, so I hit him back, bang. <laughs> and you know when a punch really connects and you can feel, I could feel that I've given him a massive black eye and, and, and his lips already bleeding. But give the guy credit, he fought back as hard as I fought, he fought neither of us were backing down but the funny thing was he's like right stop and take my cardigan off <laughs> right <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and there's someone in the crowd right because this is crowd of our kids all, all were like behind me and their kids were but someone in the crowd went is he gonna take all his clothes off <laughs> right? brilliant in his head he's probably using it as an excuse ah oh, this is why i'm not winning I've yeah. still got clothes on. <laughs> he was just like, you know, every time I hit him so hard, he needed to get his senses back. So he'd like take a bit of clothing off. But anyway, cut long story short, at the end, the fight, the fight just went out of me, mate. You know, you feel it when it just it just dropped out of you. And fortunately, at that stage, a neighbor came out and went, What are you boys doing? Stop it now, right? And back in those days, we used to listen to adults or yep. kids, kids listen to adults, right? Yeah. It was like and a guy like shoved his hand out and went, yeah, let's call, you know, should we stop it there or what, whatever? And I'm like, yeah, all right. But anyway, fast forward, he's a bloody good guy. You know, we're, we, we've been mates to this day. Every time I see him, we have to go through the protocol of him apologizing to me. <laughs> he's like, Chris, I'm really sorry, mate. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian, Ian, if you ever get a chance to watch this, hello, mate. And he's a he's a he's a lovely bloke, right? And I, I'm just saying it to highlight we we all change, don't we? You know, we, you know, we we all change. We're all a product of our environment, our circumstance, and 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 as you said, Tony, until we understand it for what it is, rather than what we think it is, we we can't move forward ourselves, can we? No, no, it, it, exactly, uh, and and I and I do hope that he, if he's still out there, that he's changed his ways. Um, you know, it could quite easily have been me who who went down that that path. Mm. Um, you know, the my my reaction to. To, to, to the stabbing afterwards could have been like well you know that's what I, that's how I need to be then I need to you know start stabbing people before before I get stabbed again it's like if you're like a bully generally you'll go one way or the other you, you, you'll you, you'll either end up hating bullies or you'll become a bully yourself because the majority of bullies were were actually bullied quite a bit themselves mm. um which again has calmed me down that thought and empathy and just, you know, looking at it a little bit deeper has also helped calm me down before when looking at a bully or, or, or seeing someone being bullied and instantly getting angry. 
it, you kind of, I, I kind of then get calmed down with the thought of, well, hold on a minute. There's a very good chance that they were bullied to such an extent themselves when they were younger to actually cause them to be a bully. So it kind of shifts from anger to then actually feeling, you know, sorry for the person. And, and is, is it too late? Can they be helped? You know, first and foremost, it needs to stop. Don't get me wrong. I'm not all wishy-washy and be like, oh, you know, um, be a bit more thoughtful of bullies. Not at all. You know, stop it hard now. And if that need, if they need to be sort of, you know, have a hard line taken to them, um, then so be it. But there's there's definitely more, more to it, isn't there? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean this is the irony of when we were young at school is the kid that was brought out in front of the class and spanked in front of the class. Ironically, like he's the lad that has to go home to a bloody broken family, the father that's on the, on the drink or whatever, and he's not getting the love at home that he, and this manifests in, in the child's behavior, doesn't it? Because, you know, well, it just, it, 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 it just does. It's probably, another conversation again and um yeah and, and, and all this knowledge tony it's been hidden from us for years which is why i love these chats you know it's why that my son i'll tell him i love him like 50 times a day he gets fed up with me kissing him you know um it might surprise people to know that you know i didn't get hugged as a kid i i my mum occasionally dad once right i had to instigate that in my family after i let's use the word recovered or after i came through my experience of chronic addiction and i started to do what we're discussing now which is put the jigsaw together think about other people why was my childhood the way it was what did these people have to go through in their lives in order that they behave that way oh my god they're suffering trauma, aren't they? I, I'd never thought of that before, right? Because things were always just so black and white. And and um, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought. But um, but yeah, my son, uh, uh, it, it, I, I don't mind to show him all my faults, which I do all the time. <laughs> it's a perfect example. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, want him to know is what I mentioned, you know, you, you are that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because you, you could have gone one way or, or the other. Um, uh, my, my wife, for example, was abused as, as a child. She had a really, really tough, um, tough childhood. And she's the most loving person annoyingly so because if ever I'm having a bit of a, a, a downtime or I'm a bit grumpy um, she's so good at staying calm and being nice and it's like no stop being nice I want to be angry <laughs> um, but she's the most loving person to a fault and so much love to give and like you say you know where some people might be embarrassed to, to show their love and to kiss their kids and and um it's just not there it's not on her radar she's got no issues with, with showing her love um and she could quite easily have gone the other way yeah very much so um in that respect society is becoming a better place there's not so many kind of false taboos and this sort of oh Hang on, hang on a sec, stuff's happening. That's the very first time something's popped up over Zoom. I'm not, not, not quite sure what's going on there. Old men in technology, eh? <laughs> um, still got me, you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? Don't... Yeah, yeah, I've, I've still got you loud and clear. Good. Good. Some something's going on today with our technology, but hey ho, this is the the world we're we're moving into. We've got some bad weather spreads 
over the country at the moment, haven't we? So I'm, I'm sure that's that's not helping. Yeah, that's ironic, isn't it? That Marines are supposed to be good at dealing with bad weather, and yet it's fucked us both now. <laughs> <laughs> um, let let's move on then and talk about when when were you at Limston Town? I was at Limston to early 2000. Wow. So 12 years after I was. Yeah, so I, I was fed. I joined up quite late. So there, there was a bit of a gap because um, after um, after the, the, the stabbing and I, I try not to make it such a, a focal point, if you like, but at the end of the day, it, it it is. It is sort of one of those main points that you refer to as you look through through your life. Um, so I was fifteen when that happened, and I, I I shouldn't really feel a way about referring to it because it 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 was it did have a big effect because I did it wasn't addressed. I didn't have any help afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, it was horrendous trying to get my head around. Um, sort of how to be afterwards. I was scared to go out the house. I was scared to be around people. Um, I was constantly thinking I was going to get stabbed again if I was in a crowd on a bus with people sitting behind me. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's difficult not to refer to it. But I was 15 at the time and I didn't join the military until I was sort of in my early to mid 20s. So there was quite a bit of a gap there. I did go off the rails. Um, there was uh, substance abuse involved in that, you know, in a city, getting up to the wrong staff, um, in with the wrong crowds. Um, so, you know, me going back to saying I could have gone one way or the other, um, I did actually, you know, I did very nearly, well, not nearly, but I did kind of go that way, but luckily not to the extent where something really stupid happened if, if that makes sense you know I, I, I come I come to the realization that I, I, I need to get a grip and and sort of you know there, there's more there's more to this than just running around the streets causing havoc and um, so I, I applied myself and eventually put in for for marine training wow so the year 2000, that's when training got really, really easy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently, when they held their hands all the way through. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, there, there, it, there was, I think it's even, um, I. I was just before it had a big change again, because I, I was before the time, I think they put an extra two weeks on to, to teach um, GPS training and so on and so forth, because things were really gearing up uh, for, for Afghan. So it was becoming more, more operational specific. They were throwing a few more things in. Um, but yeah, it, it's even in my time, you know, it's it's quite different now what I hear to, to what it was even in my time. Yeah, it's a forever changing landscape. Um, now they've changed. <laughs> this is just a learning thing for all of us, especially the youngsters listening that want to join the Marines. It used to be um, 99% need not apply, right? You know, because only the one percent are born with it, right? Or or brought up to have that mindset. Now it's it's something like ninety nine percent need to apply, and we'll we'll make you into that one percent, right? You know, this is advertising promotion, isn't it? They they've cleverly yeah. changed it now to um, up their recruitment numbers. Now 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 actually anyone can apply. You know, <laughs> yeah yeah, everyone can do it. Yes, yes, yes. There is, it is an age-old argument, isn't it? Does training get easier or harder? And well, it's um, yeah, maybe a subject for another day. And going to upset someone if we talk about that. It's a big subject, isn't it? Yeah, and like you say, uh, 
verging on on political. Yes. What? How did you find Limston then? What What was it like to rock up? Did they call it induction when you were there, or was it called foundation? Um, I think uh, foundation or. Do you know what? I can't even remember. I think it was foundation, foundation block. Yeah, yeah. I think it was foundation. Um, I just found out yesterday on a, on a, on a pod, podcast with a wonderful chap called Rich Jones, ex Tanky. Um, he was in prison and he said, Yeah, when I was in induction, I was like, You're in induction in prison. I said, I was in induction in the military. What, what does that tell us? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, I suppose it's all about conditioning and getting ready, you know, the first steps to getting ready to what's to come, uh, I suppose, and, and being um, being shown what's expected of you and then sort of build on it. Did you find, yeah. did you find training, I would say easy, because I don't think anyone finds it easy, but some, some get through it less unscathed than others, right? I, I think what helped me was being that little bit older and, and having um, some life experiences. Uh, that, uh, I'm sure that that did help. Um, I'm not sure if the 16 year old Tony would have done as good as the 20 year old Tony. Um, it certainly does help when you need to dig deep uh, and you can sort of pull on. You've got more, more to draw on, I, I, I think. Um, in a kind of a way it makes me respect the younger lads and it makes you think well you, you know you really are going to go on to, um, to to be successful in whatever you want to do because if you can find what's needed at, at, at such a young age um, then you know you, you've obviously got something inside you naturally um, not to say that I didn't have that as well but I certainly, certainly had a leg up, I think, with being that little bit older. Mm. Still, it's still horrendous, though. <laughs> yeah. I've said this quite a lot, mate, is I, 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 I struggled with the speed marching. That was the only thing I really struggled with in training. And I never failed. I, I, I never failed any because I, I just wouldn't give up. Right. But they they hurt. Right. One time I got ordered into the rat wagon because I had um, I developed shin splints and I was grimacing so much that the corporal went through, get in the rat wagon. I was, All right, corporal. When he turned around, I just kept running with the troop. You know, I just I went to the back of the troop and I kept running at the back. When he turned the tech at second time and saw I'd ignored his order, he wasn't very happy. So I, I had to get in a the wagon then. Right. But. Other than that, I used to just hang in there and it was freaking the hardest thing I've ever, ever done. And yet at 50 years old, I did a quadruple Ironman <laughs> and, you know, ran the length of the country. Um, and it was OK. I did get a shin splint running the length of the country, but it didn't stop me. And I just remember it it's so much easier at this age. You know, the mindset is there. Yeah. I'm a big believer in, in the want as well, if it's something that you want to do. And I, I touched on it when I was talking to Jamie on the No Excuse podcast. And if, um, if it's something that you truly want to do, then you'll find a way you'll find something you know as you're digging down to search for whatever it is you need to find to keep you going on you will find something your 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 brain will will give you something you know because you have that perception of this is what i want and i can do it um and it's not just us uh, you know we we're, we're not superhumans we're, we're not overly special than anyone else it's just that want so say a doctor with the years of training and and how intensive that is you know five years with all of that written work the long hours on um doing the placements in the hospital as you're training as a doctor 
Um, it's because they, the, those that make it, it's because they want to do it. So for, for me, that's such a, a big thing um, because anyone who genuinely wants to do something but it's a bit worried if they should or not or if they not if they should if they could if they can you know i really want to do this but i'm just not sure if i'm going to be able to well actually all you need really is the want if you want to do something then then you can do it mm. you know for me that's the biggest thing and it's rightfully or wrongfully we could end up with loads of comments um you know against that but one of the biggest things that sticks in my mind is the reason I've been able to do the things that I've done throughout my life, whether it be Marines, um, whether it be the SBS, whether it be being able to come up with a, um, a, a new business with a unique product. You know, I wanted to do them. I wanted to join Marines. I wanted to be a special forces operator and I wanted to have um, my own business. It just, just so happened to, to end up being a, you know, a unique product, an idea that I had, but it's all things that I wanted to do. Um, you know, and it, it's just, it's just doing them really. Yeah. Let, well, let's talk about your the, special. The one is the biggest thing. Yeah. Let's talk about your special forces um, route because that's a very brave thing. Brave probably isn't the right word, but you really have to want to do that. I mean, it's not, there's, you can't half ass around and join the special forces. It doesn't work like that. You, you've got to know that when you hit that selection, you've got the goods and you've done the training and you can read the map. Um, and obviously, the majority of people still fall by the wayside. So I've just got a huge amount of respect for people that can be that young and have that, have that mindset. How old, how old were, were you when you decided, how, how long did you do in the Corps before you went SB or as a, as a Marine, I should say? About, about two and a half years, which again is really does reinforce the point that I was making with, with the want. Um, before I joined the Marines, SB was the way that I wanted to go. And I, I kind of said to myself that, okay, if I join the Marines, mm. it will be for the ultimate goal of going SF and as quickly as I can. I, I had no real interest of staying in the Marines. Um, so really from, from day one, the, the goal was, was to go SB. So I think what helped me was ignorance and not being fully educated in, in what it may entail because I installed the want so firmly that it was stronger, that passion to want to do it was stronger than anything I found out afterwards. So once I did start really finding out what it entailed with, you know, how switched on you have to be when you're tired, how much rope you're actually given to hang yourself, um, you know, you don't get the motivation, um, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, you have actually really got to be able to do the things that's asked of you. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the passion for wanting to do that was so great by that time that none of that really sort of phased me as such. But I wasn't, I wasn't clouded to it. I, I, I wasn't blind to it. I still fully realized that this is serious and I, I, I seriously have to get better at navigation and whatever else it is that I could do to, to make sure that I'm as prepared as possible. Mm. Um, and that really sort of manifested itself once I got to um, 4-2. So I was based at 4-2 um, out of Limston. 
<clears throat> and I had to hold myself back from telling people and telling the other lads that, look, my aim is to not be here. Uh, is, to, is to be here for as short amount of time as possible because I want to go SF. Because anyone that I did tell, I'd get laughed at. I'd get told I was stupid. I'd get told I was unrealistic. I'd get told that I was, um, I don't know, a, a bit of a bullshitter. You know, people are like, what is, look at, can you hear him? He, he's only been in five minutes and he's already talking about SF. Because predominantly, you know, you have to have five, six, seven years experience. They generally wanted someone with combat experience as well. I know that it changed quite regularly over the years and they, they would change their requirement depending on what was happening and, and, and how they had to recruit. But generally, it was you needed a certain amount of experience before applying. So when the Sergeant Major was constantly trying to get me to go SIGs because he had to get his quota up, I kept saying, no, sir, sorry, I, you know, SF is the way that I want to go. Stop being so stupid. It's SIGs you want, isn't it? No, no, I don't <laughs> want SIGs. I was constantly getting, but I, I annoyed them enough that they eventually said, you know what, it, it's, it, it, it's your, you know, it's yours to lose then. <clears throat> and they loaded me on, um, on the briefing course, which is the first, thing you have to pass before getting loaded onto selection um <clears throat> and that was just after two years of, of being in the unit i was effectively a civvy still really had you been on operations by this time no, no. wow again it was all driven by by passion so they could see on the briefing course jesus christ this this is an absolute ball of fire um you've you know and that's why we're going to load you on selection be aware that if it wasn't for that you wouldn't be because you haven't got enough experience um you know you've only been in for a couple of years you've got no operational experience but we can see that you want this so much and that you are you're serious you know they could see it in my eyes mm. that i got loaded onto selection the the other thing that really motivated me was <laughs> the sergeant major said on one condition i'm going to load you on the briefing course on one condition that if you fail it i'm drafting you to scotland bearing in mind we just moved from london to the married quarters in plymouth so we were kind of loving life because plymouth compared to london was was beautiful you got all the moors and the you know the the the, the, the countryside almost it, it it was beautiful and I, so i was like wow that's motivation I, I do not want to have to move my family up up to scotland where i'm probably going to end up doing uh, some kind of guard duty for for, for for most of the time that i'm there uh, went home explained that to my wife and she said okay well i'm gonna you know put put one up on that um if you don't pass and you get drafted to Scotland, I'm not coming with you. <laughs> so I thought, Jesus Christ, it's all to play for. Um, but you know what? It, it didn't fade. I thought, I'm going to put that to the back of my head. You know, I really want this. So I, I, I'm I, the best chance I've got of succeeding is to just keep keep my mind on the fact of that this is what I want. Um, the one thing that did worry me was, was uh, injury. You know, I, I knew that it was never really going to be an issue with me thinking, I can't do this and I want to give up. So, yeah, it was, it was injury, but I, I was lucky. You know, I, I didn't have any major injuries at all. Did you do the joint SASSBS section? Yeah, so it was, it was joint, joint selection. Um, and, you know, some of the best soldiers that I've ever worked with were, um, were from the parachute regiment and, and various other army regiments. For that, it's absolutely fantastic because there was kind of equal amounts of um, Marines to, to army lads. And um, yeah, yeah, it was a joint, joint selection. And if it's a joint selection, Tony, 
how do they incorporate the diving bit in it or the swimming bit? Well, do, do they are they interested in that or is that is that put aside? No, that, well, that's continuation training. So once you pass selection, so you've got your phases of, of selection, which is the the hills phase, then on to the jungle, resistance to interrogation, escape and evasion. Then do a bit of continuation training still with um, the Hereford lads because you, you then get badged at the end. If, if you're lucky enough to pass after the escape and evasion and resistance to interrogation phase, you then get badged. You've then got to do uh, a, a period afterwards of continuation training where you go up to Hereford, you do all of your close quarter battles, your, your CQB training in the killing house. Um, uh, Hereford, because of their budget, we even had an ex-Olympian, an, an ex-Olympic um, sharpshooter who taught us handgun skills on the range, so on and so forth. Wow. So you're still together at that point, plus all of the the, um, the car drills where they've got a drive-in, a drive-on range where you can actually drive onto the range and practice doing your, your car drills if you come up to an illegal BCP and you've got to start you know, get out the car, start shooting um, at the threat and, and pull back. Uh, so you're still together at that point. Once you've done that, you then go your separate ways. So the Hereford lads then go to their squadrons and the SB lads go to their squadrons. <clears throat> and you're still on your continuation training. So that's then when the diving takes place for the pool lads uh, the and whatever continuation training it is that they do at Hereford, whether it be the um, skydiving and so on and so forth. Yeah, the reason I mention it is I don't, I used to know a little bit about how selection was for SB before they, they amalgamated the two, right? Um, friend of mine, Steve, everyone will know, uh, if I say SV, everyone will know who I'm on about. We we're in uh, Belfast together and he, he, um, I think he joined SB twice actually and was also an ML in, in the middle of it. Um, and I remember him saying he didn't get on with the diving, right? And it seems a lot of expense to put someone all the way through the selection and the jungle and the escape and evasion only to find out at the end of it that maybe, you know, they got claustrophobia or underwater or something, or they, they can't get on with a breathing. If, if that happens, do they keep the guy, but he just does another role or, or, or are you, you out of there? Uh, there there's actually no, not at all. No, there's a, you're, you're still used. Absolutely. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it, it's, it, there's actually a, quite a few guys that are non-divers um for various different reasons uh, for me myself i was a non-diver i en ended up being a non-diver because with afghan kicking off as soon as i got to the squadron um <clears throat> we were still supposed to be on continuation training and dive the dive course being one of those um the there was a couple of us that got picked to to not go on dive course because we needed to go straight out to Afghan to for manpower issues and, and to um, to bolster up the squadrons with uh, with injuries and, uh, and and deaths and and I was one of those guys so I I, I pretty much went straight out to Afghan from, from selection wow which which I'm, was quite tough. I'm going to guess the other guy was Stephen Burns, wasn't it? But, uh, but yeah, you get there's quite a few guys. Oh, say again. Um, I was going to say the other. We, we got a bit of a freeze thing going on. Oh. I'm just going to talk through it. Um, the other guy would have been Stephen yeah. Burns because Steve's been on the podcast. And when I said to him, "How did you get on with the diving?" He said, "I didn't do it, Chris." And I was, I was gobsmacked. An SBS guy that didn't. Three knows his ears. <clears throat> was that what it was? 
Yeah, he said he went just. I, yeah, I, and that's one of probably. It's probably one of the biggest reasons, I think. I, I don't know the numbers or, or or the statistics behind it, but just thinking of the amount of guys that I know that that didn't do or didn't complete the dive course because of perforated eardrums because mm. of the pressure. Um, I, I, I get a sense that that's one of the big reasons. Um, so really probably from the start of, of, of the SBS, you know, the start of its life um, from, you know, way back in the 1940s, they've, they've probably been used to still having guys on that, that are non-divers because let's face it, they, the, the, the job roles that SB have done uh, alongside Hereford, uh, uh, you know, fairly similar. It's just a method of insertion, whereas mm -hmm. the actual conflicts themselves, uh, you know, we, we do we do the same stuff as far as the job role is concerned. It, it's just historically, it's different methods of insertion. So Hereford would come in from the air, we'd come in from from the water. Um, but in recent conflicts, for example, say Afghan, it's a level playing field. You know, there, there's there was no coming in from the water, um, so. And the uh, yeah. the RAF regiment would come in from the Nafi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like it, I've, I've been in worse restaurants. I've been in worse civic restaurants than some of the RAF Nafis. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, when you do your paracourse and stuff, and bloody hell, the food is just like out of this world, isn't it? For our friends but listening, just, the, the RAF have a huge budget because each bomb that they fire from a bloody helicopter gunship or whatever costs like a million pounds. So it's nothing for them to have a huge, <laughs> a huge food budget as well. Yeah, massive, massive budget. But just very quickly going back to um, to Stevie Burns. Uh, Stevie Burns was on my side. I went through selection with, with Stevie. Uh, absolutely great guy. Top top guys, he's doing some 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 great stuff at the moment as well, isn't he? So, yeah, that yeah, was um, he, he nice, did, nice to hear his name. Actually. Yeah, he did say he dragged you through. <laughs> I think he <laughs> yeah, it's all thanks to him. I, I was I was behind him. He was he was he was dragging me through. That's right. <laughs> yes. So Stevie Burns for people listening. Um, was the founder of Op Spartan, Operation Spartan, which is a wonderful support group. Um, you can find it on Facebook or just put it into a search engine. And it's not just for military service, it's for the blue light services as well. And they do some really good stuff. And it's also a bunch of kind of similar minded people that have found themselves struggling as as many of us have and they they support each other and they're all gonna they're all started running haven't they and they're all eating a better diet now and they're taking action with their lives and it and it's it's all good stuff to uh, see so shout out to steve absolutely one of the most genuine people uh, i i know I, I don't talk to him he, as much as i'd like to um to, to be honest with you mm. Um, but he's, if you're ever in trouble, he's, he's certainly someone that you'd want in your corner, for sure. Tony, give us an idea for us, us Marines. How much harder is the legendary physical side of selection? So the hill work and all this kind of stuff. How, it, can you kind of give me an idea? Because obviously I've done the 30 miler, I've done the nine miler, um, 12 mile low carry or what, or all these things that we used to do. Is it, is it like harder than that? Is it the same? Is it, is it, is it different? It's, it's such a good question. Um, and I, I think it's gonna vary massively through the individual because a lot of it is 
is psychological. Um, the, I would say I've had tougher times in the Marines than I did on selection because I was more mentally prepared for selection. Um, <laughs> to try and give an example, I, I think of, of the hills. At the end of the day, it's it's a hard course. So I think you would you you know what it would would be like. Yeah, you you would you definitely would have had just as tough a times with stuff you've done in the Marines. Um, like you say, with the commando course at the end, um, that week of having to do those tests back to back, culminating in that 30 miler. Um, there's no getting away from it. You know, it's extremely cheeky, extremely hard work. Um, and I think the hills, I think what, what makes it more especially tough is and different from from marine training is you haven't got someone there giving you encouragement you haven't got you know a fantastic team of corporals and and, and a sergeant you know as in a, a training team like you have going through marine training giving you the support or or beasting <laughs> depending on what training team you had but at the end of the day whether it be you know, support or, or or shouting, whatever it was, it was still someone there either saying, get the fuck up and keep going, or come on, you can do it. Whatever it might be, it's still something. You're still getting something that's urging you to um, to carry on. You don't have that, you know, and certainly through the hills phase, if you find yourself halfway through the hills, on one of the marches or halfway through the hills phase sorry so you're already knackered after a couple of weeks um halfway through one of the marches in the middle of bloody nowhere uh, again you really have to draw on is this what i want because you, you'll take your bergen off you'll sit on your bergen just to catch your breath and you will be thinking jesus christ is, is this what i want mm. Um, so that's what makes it tough, not so much the physical side of it. Yeah, it's, it, it is pretty much, you know, you have to want to do it, but on steroids, because you've got no one there to, to say, come on, you can do this. Um, that's what makes it tough. Yeah, got you, summed it up perfectly. And what was it... Um... What was it like then to get out to Afghanistan? I, 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 I was shit scared. I was shit scared. Um, I, I've got to be careful what I say because there were, yeah, there, there were things in, in place that, that, that should have happened really and did kind of change after um, after, after my first tour, but uh, effectively, <clears throat> when when I landed in Afghan, um, I, I still wasn't sure what I was doing, <laughs> and and again, that kind of overrides the fear of I'm in war. You know, I'm I'm in Afghan. Um, that that. I didn't have time to really think about that because I was so preoccupied in thinking about, am I going to fuck up and be a liability to the other guys? Um, that's, that's what made it difficult to me. So I, I was absolutely shitting myself and, and, you know, I'll be perfectly honest and it might be surprising for pe people to, to hear it, but um I, I, I was worried about my confidence. You know, am I ready? I, I passed selection, but that's all it is. It's a selection course. And I didn't have, and I think that's why they want people to have that certain amount of experience before going on selection. Because I, I, I found it extremely, extremely tough. And it did end up taking its toll uh, because um, I was just constantly, constantly 
worried um, if, if I was going to be able to produce the goods. Um, sure enough, obviously, you know, you get the experience and it all, all ends up coming good. But um, yeah, that, that first time was, was horrendous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was on my own as well because I, I went to go fill up the numbers from injuries and deaths that had happened in the current squadron that was out there. Um, I, it was as I was walking past the 2IC's office in Z Squadron, in the squadron that I joined, um, and the 2IC at the time was like, ah, Tony, come back. It was like, how about going to Afghan? <laughs> and it was like, yeah, well, gee, yeah, <laughs> of, of course. Wow. But, um, yeah, so it wasn't like deploying with your buddies, you know, as a group, and you've done all of the build up training, this, that, and the other. It was like, right, you know, you're right man, right place, or wrong man, or right man, wrong place, wherever you want to look at it, you know, first come, first serve. Do you want to go to Afghan? You need to make up the numbers. They're getting smashed at the moment. Did they give you a private jet? <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to have got off it. Yeah. <laughs> See, that, that's the thing, right? When we rocked up in Belfast, and things went bang over there quite a lot when we were there, right? But we were all ready for it, right? Because the build-up was so bloody good. In, in fact, the problem was the build-up so good. So for our friends at home, you, you go to a village in, in Kent. Um, they got a whole mock-up of a, of, a, of a town a town there. They get um, civilian, uh, they get people from other military units to come and act as civilians. So they all like, you know, gobbing off and all this stuff in mock Irish accents. And you go out on patrol every day. And depending on what phase of the training you're at, people might open up on you from a building. You've got to take cover. You, 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 we call it brick commander. So your team commander's got to get on a, on the radio, report contact, casualties, yes or no, while taking charge of, of the team. Every time you stop, you do a five meter check. So you're looking for IEDs or you're looking for hidden weapons, all this sort of stuff. The problem was when we got to, and you do, your, your team will be contacted. You turn around and the guys, you know, your, your oppo is lying on the floor and there's a referee there that goes, he's been shot sucking chest wounds this kind of stuff right you've got to deal with that while under fire and all this stuff and th then there's day-to-day -day kind of admin stuff like stopping the players right excuse me sir can I have a word or excuse me you know joseph or whatever here a minute mate you know checking the id so where are you off to today okay right blah, blah, blah. basically giving the players our, our time it was or interrupting their, their 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 network and the problem was when we got out to belfast tony it was all quiet <laughs> for for the first couple of weeks anyway right and then you're like oh what was all that training for nothing's happening you know yes you were stopping people and doing your five meter checks and and you know covering your arcs and zigzagging as you as you patrol down the street but Nothing happened, but when it, when it did start going bang and we and we started to get contacts, just immediately, take cover. Ch -ch, you just went into the drill, and it was it was so surreal that it was so much like what we'd been trained to do, right? Although you can never train perfectly. So, did you have any build up before you went, or were you just like, right, your your badge now, off you go? Well. The, I suppose there's all you've always got the build up and it, it, to, to a certain extent through through selection and um, you 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 really do get taught the, um, the, the the core basics of how you conduct business in in, in an SF um, squadron. Uh, you know, with with the way that you um, break contact. Um, you know the way that you engage whether it be contact front left right behind you know so there is that there working in within the small teams um, all of your CQB training as well it's a 
you do have that there. You know, straight out of the box, you, you are a, a highly trained soldier um, within the context of working in, you know, an SF team. So, so that that was there. It's I think what makes it difficult with not having or missing out on pre-deployment training like I did on my first tour because it it was so fast and furious because it it, it it was at that the, the heyday of what was going on um in in afghan and we were losing guys and they did have to you know find guys from the other squadrons that weren't deployed to afghan to to, to go out and make the numbers up um it just so happens that generally that would be from someone who's already been in the service for, for X amount of years, you know, it's just finding someone who's available. Um, it, it was just, it just so happens that that person was me and, and, and I, I was just out of the box and I, I hadn't had PDT training. So the difference that makes is just the small nuances on, on how that team works. Um, the, the big thing for me was the vehicle drills. So that was completely new to me. So going straight out behind enemy lines, working on the vehicles and actually driving one of them, I found myself in the driving seat. Um, I had done the course by the way, but I hadn't, because I hadn't done PDT training with that particular squadron, I didn't know exactly how the brake contact drills were going to go with the vehicles i'd never done it so i it, it's it was a massive massive stress of having to learn on the job and asking questions whilst i was behind enemy lines and whilst i was driving that vehicle you know if we get contacted what are they going to do in front what are they going to do behind where do i need to place myself the most horrendous experience I've ever had um, be, because again it's not the fear of something happening it's the fear of failure it's the fear of ballsing up and other people getting hurt because of your incompetence even though it wasn't my fault it was still such a stress um, but yeah it's <clears throat> it's it does it does make a a, a massive difference because my second tour was 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 so much I, I, i'll not use the word enjoyable that, that's completely the wrong word um it was more comfortable because i did go through the, the full process you know of <clears throat> you know being with my own squadron for, for starters you know the guys that i was used to that i'd worked with um full pdt training we we knew the ins and outs of 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 how each other worked and what we would do uh, depending on what 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 would happen um and it was a lot more comfortable in that respect you know you you, you could you you could almost sort of be again not look forward to it but it was one less thing on your mind you know, it, it then freed you up to be able to, you know, th think about <clears throat> um, other more important things, if, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Um, I think probably anybody listening can relate it to something that they do in their lives. Because once you've learned it all and you, you know it inside out, you can relax and enjoy then, can't you? You know, and just be, yeah. it's like writing. When I used to write books, I had to stop every three minutes, get a search engine up and type, right, what is, what's a semicolon? Ah, right. And I'd have to do that 30 times before I actually, in my heart, knew what a semicolon does, right? You know, um, when do I put an introductory comma? Right, read that, read a book. Now I can just write, right? I can just edit, I can punctuate, I can do all that. I also understand the bits that I can fuck up and they don't matter, right? So there should be a comma there, but I don't have to put it. No one's ever gonna, no one's ever gonna write to me and go, Chris, why was that comma not there? It's no one, 99.8% of people are not even gonna know that that was actually an issue, you know? Um, 
so yeah i think we can all relate to that when when once i mean it's like a professional footballer isn't it when they get that good their training is on the pitch it's that it's the match they play on the saturday and then they can not even train in the next saturday bang that that you know the fitness is up there the skills are up there and they can just perform 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 whereas when you must join a football team you're like oh god on the fng on the fucking new guy i don't i i don't want to fuck this up for everybody All yeah, the so i can... i had that so it was almost twofold you know threefold even so i had that new guy element on that first tour and then on top of that, not doing, having the chance to do PDT training. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was, it, it was horrendous. It was so, it was quite weird because obviously I had the buzz of, I'm, I'm, I'm actually here now, you know, you, you're doing the job that you've been trained for. You're actually now, you know, you, you, you really are at, at the sharp end of it all. So it was kind of a, a bit of mixed emotions. Um, but I do want to make clear that um, I don't, this isn't, you know, a, 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 a smirk towards the SBS uh, at all. Uh, at the end of the day, it was at the heyday of Afghan, um, guys were dying um, and I, I, I was trained, I was a trained rank, you know, I was a badged rank um, and they did very quickly afterwards, not because of me, um, but it did come into place quite quickly that no one would deploy unless they'd done PDT training. So even someone who was going to um, sort of make up the numbers and, and replace someone who's been injured or killed, they would still have to do a form of, of PDT training. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it was just the times, it was very desperate times with what was going on um with with all of the fighting and at the end of the day if i couldn't learn quickly i wouldn't have got into the squadrons anyway so yeah. Yeah. you know it, it was it was just a bit a little bit harder for me because i had to really learn on the job it was best better they sent you out there than my bloody sister or something <laughs> i'm sure you, i'm sure you were the best man for the job <laughs> Um, and by PDT, I'm guessing we mean pre-deployment training for for our uh, for our armchair warriors out there. Um, how is it then, Tony, when you got into your team there? And and obviously we don't say names or anything like that. And this isn't bad mouthing anyone, but it's like as a sprog in the Marines when you get into your troop or your set or, or troops broken down into four, three or four sections you could end up with some right angry bastard corporal, you know, and if he didn't like you on day one, because basically he had an alcohol problem and he was angry all the time, he made your life a freaking misery, right? Or, or it might be a Lance corporal that thinks he's a bit of a guy, you know, and he's creeping up to the corporal and they, they decide that you're the, you know, that, that this, you see this happen a lot, you know, or, or you get the guy, he's done one Norway and he thinks he's, that makes him Captain America, right? The guy I'm thinking of used to go around with a pick elf, threatening all the new, new, you know, threatening to stove their heads in with a pick elf. This, this is a recurring theme in some of my dits, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is you very much got put in your place when you got to your unit, right? You know, you learn who you could fight and who you shouldn't fight because they're just going to beat the shit out of you. You learn who, who you could gob off to, who you could have a quiet word with if you needed to. And don't get me wrong, for people listening, 90, 95% of the guys were very, very nice men, you know, really, really good good people but that don't help you if that <laughs> if you're lumbered with one of the five percent so taking this to sf tony are you welcome like um a, an equal professional 
or is there any kind of hierarchy, this sort of thing? Oh, are we frozen again? Hang on. Oh, we're unfrozen. Did you hear that, mate? Sorry. Uh, I, I got bits of it. Yeah, we 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 froze up a little bit again. Yeah, I was just sort of saying when you get into your SF team, are you treated like a brother? Well, I mean, you know, you're all brothers, but is it like you've done the training? You you you're a, you're an equal professional, or can you get some idiots in there? You always do. I, I think you know you'll find that in any walk of life, in any industry, in any job. Um, you know, nothing is impervious, nothing is perfect. Um, and you will always have characters. You'll, you'll always have um, different personalities uh, to, to varying degrees. Um, I, I, I think it comes down to specifics, doesn't it? So you've got what I, I think you might be talking about with people slipping through the net in regards to having those traits that you wouldn't expect to find in something as, as um, high performing as, as, a, as an SF squadron, um, like a, a bit of a bully, a, a bully trait or um, uh, someone who, you know, can't sort of move forward and, and continue to sort of innovate themselves, if you like. So they, they're sort of stuck in their way and, and um, that they'll try to have that same sort of mentality that you might find in the army or, or some of the um, marine units. You do still get that. You do still get that. But the other aspect of it is that you've got certain personalities that you can run into that you would never be friends with they're not particularly nice people. Um, not many. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of just one or two people. And again, I am generalising. I'm also thinking of other industries and, and, and work, work um, experiences that I've had. But um, when it comes down to professionalism, they're top class. And you would want them in your corner if there's ever a problem with something. So it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, yes. You, you still do get certain people that would be like you described, be a bit of a bully and, and still think that they're, you know, God's gift and that they try to sort of throw their weight around. Um, luckily, with something that's as close-knit as, as F, SF squadrons, they, they kind of don't last that long or they'll end up realising themselves and change their ways because, you know, everyone else is like, who the fuck's that? Um, so yeah, I, I didn't. That was one of the the lures for me to go SF, or one of the um, things that, that that really sort of spurred me on to want to wanna go to to SF is that it is more grown up in that way. Um, Your and just by the very nature of the selection course and, and how tough it is, it, it kind of as good as it can weeds out those type of people. So it is only those that are a hundred percent genuine, you know, those that really, really want to be there and, and, and really do take professionalism and doing the job seriously. Not to say that other places aren't within the army and the Navy, the Marines, this, that, and the other, not at all, but it is what it is. It, 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 it's something where you do have to be that bit better, you know? And so pre predominantly it's, it's a good place to be if, um, you know, cause let's face it, you know, you, 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 you're only really going to go for something like that for, for, for certain reasons, aren't you? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have been very disappointed if I'd have got there and, and then realized that it was like a bunch of mums outside of primary school and, <laughs> and all the, the, the nickering and having to deal with bullying no not at all it, it's a high performing environment um but of course you do get people that slip through the net yes 
SF or not SF, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, aren't we? And, you know, the, yeah, people will be how people will be, unfortunately. Yeah. I was just trying to, it was, that wasn't a reference to like my situation. I'm just wondering how they would have been in the, in their unit. And, and you, you, you hear certain things, let's say, and uh, ah, anyway, enough about that shit. Um, can we, just before we talk about your company, Tony, so your fitness apparatus company is, is, is for, for our friends at home wondering what I'm talking about not military company um can you tell us like did you have any big firefights so over there or, or did or what was it like to be involved in your your first one or or, or were things quite quiet no they, they they weren't quiet so it was it was during that busy period of um when things were kicking off in in afghan um for as you'll appreciate for obvious reasons i'm not gonna you know go go into um massive detail about anything at all really mm. but um really sort of keeping it high level and generalized the 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 first contact that i was in um i absolutely shit my pants um stuff started coming back and this is looking back on it now um, things started coming back to me from the stabbing incident. And this goes back to what I was talking about with where I really should have had help with that as a as a 15 year old boy. Because once the once the rounds started flying and cordons were getting contacted as well. So, you know, there was contacts all, all around where where I was. I thought we were surrounded. And I was having flashbacks of of being stabbed, you know, and that I'm going to be having them all come from all directions. I had to massively get a grip of myself. Um, obviously, ended up, you know, professionalism goes through. Plus, you, with the lad, you, you you bring yourself to, to your senses. But yeah, I, everyone would probably remember their first contact for various different reasons. That's my reason. I, I absolutely shat myself. I had flashbacks of being stabbed. Um, and then on top of that, that made it all the more memorable is the batteries in my MVGs died. And that wasn't through bad admin. We were still on the old MVGs just prior to the new ones coming in. The new, um, out there, out one alpha, the pec, not the pec, the, um, uh, the gen two alphas. I can't remember the name. I'm terrible with names. That's my brain going mushy but anyway the new style of mvgs the upgraded mvgs hadn't yet come in uh, so we were still on the old mvgs they they were they were great for you know they served their purpose um, but they were getting on a bit and some of them were you know a bit temperamental so you can imagine just as we're stacking up so i'll paint the picture at a compound stacking up there's heavy fire coming from the alleyway that, that we were stacking up about to go round into the alleyway. And person in front of me, he's gone round, we're all moving. It's go, go, go. MBG's cut out, completely blind. The only thing that was illuminating what was in front of me was the sparks of the bullets coming off of the, the side of the, um, the walls in, in the corridor, in, in, in the alleyway. And that sort of illuminated it enough. Uh, and sure enough, with a couple of bangs and twiddling things, they, they came back on again. But horrendous. My first hey, contact. You, should, you should, put, should have put your head torch on. <laughs> <laughs> Get me mag light out. Whoa, hold on a minute. I can't see anything. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, Gosh, yeah. We, the, so people... For people at home, MVGs, night vision goggles, obviously. Although most young people who play Call of Duty, they 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 know more yeah. military stuff than I do. <laughs> yeah. Although I will tell you, bolt croppers won't cut through us. The that padlock on the people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's not that easy, folks. Honestly, you're better to chop through the fence than you are to chop through an industrial padlock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, the joys of video game, then, eh? Yeah. Tony, let me just pop us on pause. I'm just going to go and uh, punch a clown. So welcome back. Yeah, went out to punch a clown. Had to take on the whole circus. <laughs> um, yes. So how's business, mate? It, things are looking up, I'm gathering. Yeah, things are looking up. It's um, it, it's a tough road. It, it's uh, it, 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 it's it's taking its time. You know. I think it's tough for anyone, not not specifically just talking about what's happening at the moment, because it's tough for everyone, isn't it, with the situation? Um, extremely tough. Um, it has slowed things up a bit. You know, it's someone said to me, it's a fitness device. They must be flying off the shelves. Um, well, it's it's not as easy as that because the stage that we're at, um, you know, it's you, you end up having supplier issues as well because of the the, the pandemic. Um, and yeah, it does slow, slow things up a bit, but it, it is selling We're we're teamed up with, um, uh, battle ready 360, um, with Ollie Ollerton and, and Jason Fox, Foxy. So we're, we're teamed up with their company at the moment, battle ready 360, and it's ex exclusively being sold on their platform at the moment. So, um, yeah, wow. it's limited stock, you know, it's first come, first serve. It's been sold separately on the BR360 online shop, um, and it's being sold as part of a package, as a, like a bundle deal, where you can buy the Battle Ready box, which has got various different bits of fitness equipment in it, all in a box, um, plus the, the SF1 trainer as well so yeah it's going in the right direction but there's still there, there's still a bit of a way to go it is still a, a, a new a new business um we're we're really excited about how it can grow with you know further innovation on the product itself other products and services to come in the future so yeah it's it's all looking good yeah, what great endorsement from Ollie and Foxy then, eh? Doesn't get doesn't come better than that, does it? It doesn't, mate. It really, yeah, over the moon with it, and it's it's one of those things. the The product speaks for itself, and you know, you you could have the best product in the world, but if it's not marketing in the right way, and no one sees it, then it may not sell. Um, that you know, I'm under no illusions. Of course, that that is what it is. It, it's just a fact. Uh, but we are really, really lucky that it is um, a, a great product that can't. You know, they, they, the reason why I mentioned that is because so many people say the product to sell itself. Well, actually, no, it, it, a product doesn't sell itself. But what you do have is if you have got a product that is genuinely good quality uh, and a good product along with a decent bit of marketing and a bit of luck as well, um, you know, it, it, it can go a long way. Yes. And how did, how, how did it come up, come about, Tony? You, you've got your original there on the, on the right. Yeah. So I, I should explain really. So this is just one side of the product. Here's the other side. So, it is a suspension trainer. And if you imagine a TRX, you can hang it up on a pull up bar on um, any, like a, on a goal post or a, 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 a suitable tree branch. It's an established industry. There, there's lots of people out there with a suspension trainer that's of a TRX type fashion or whether it be Olympic rings. Um, so the the application of suspension training is, is is fairly quite well known now. So we're not reinventing the wheel in that way. What we're doing is, you know, something that can do what's already out there, but not just in a different way, but but better, if you like. Um, I wouldn't put TRX down. Fantastic product, really really well made. 
brilliant story behind it with Randy Hetrick, the, the ex Navy SEAL guy. Um, and it, 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 it does what it does. It's, it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant product. What ours does is actually sort of build on that. So as you can see here with, with the three handles, by pressing the buttons on, on the side, it just moves down the strap. So one way cam system, to move it up, you just pull it up. If you're not touching the buttons, it automatically locks. Wow. So the version that's getting sold at the moment is just the four handled version. So there's just two handles on each side. Um, theoretically, you can buy as many handles as you want and even come up with kind of a, a ladder system. Um, but free is the optimum. So we'll eventually we will sell a two handled version, which is just one handle on each strap. A two handled a four handled version, which is being sold now. And then the top tier product will be the six handled version, which is three handles on one strap like it is here. So once you've hung it up, Chris, mm. it's minimal to zero adjustments that you need to actually do full circuit training on a suspension trainer without having to touch it because uh, you can move the handles to where you want them so you can have the low handles to jump into press ups the middle handle to jump into mid height exercises whether it be dips or you know upright rows whatever it is you want to do and then the high handles to either do pull-ups or to hang off for leg raises and it's down to your imagination really one of the things that we found when doing the uh, the research for it and also one of the reasons why the idea came about was the 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 pain that it was to have to constantly adjust whether it be the rings or the trx so if you imagine if you had the rings up quite high so that you could do your, your dip exercises, pull-ups, whatever it might be. If you then wanted to do press-ups or have the rings lower for, for whatever reason, you'd have to actually get up quite high to then adjust the anchor point to lower it yeah. down. Yeah. Well, if you want to do a circuit, you, it's going to piss you off. The same with the TRX. You've got that single anchor point where you're constantly raising and lowering the handles. But this completely eliminates that. Uh, so you literally hang it up, come up with whatever exercises or circuit that you want, and then you can crack on. Now, if you've only got the two handled version, so just one of these handles on each side, even though you're gonna be adjusting constantly, because it's at the point of the handle, and right there, it's just slipping the handles up and down each time. So as far as the user friendliness of it's concerned, it's it's fantastic. Mm. So that's where we are at the moment. There's other ideas, there's other attachments that's gonna be coming out, um, but that's where we are with, with, with how the product is now. Um, you asked about where the idea originally came from. This is it here. <laughs> it's an old piece of deck rope with an old plas hollow plastic handle. And, and that is what sort of birthed the idea, if you like, or that's where the idea was born that turned it into to this. Got you. Uh, and it, it was through necessity. I found myself on uh, maritime operations doing the old anti-piracy stuff. And uh, it was another four month transit away in the Indian Ocean. Um, and usually one of the team would have rings or TRX or something like that, because, you know, these type of training devices are brilliant for if you've got very limited space and you can still get the maximum amount of training out of a, a minimum amount of space. So I found myself on 
a deployment where no one had bought one. And I, I was being lazy and a bit cheap with not buying something myself. But anyway, I found myself away with, with, with no suspension trainer and I was really getting into it. So I thought, you know what? It can't be that difficult. At the end of the day, rings or a TRX is just a strap or a rope with a handle on. So I, I decided to make my own, which was easy enough. A bit of rope, tie the handle in. Where I'd tied, I don't know if you can see that, I'll take it off. Where I'd put the rope through the handles, I had to tie a knot each side so they obviously didn't just slip down. So it caused, <clears throat> as it was hung up, it caused these two bits of rope to just be hanging down. Because I just wanted to use it for, for dips. So I'd do pull ups and then jump into suspended dips because it was helping me get over a plateau. But then I thought, ah, oh, hold on a minute. Looking down at these bits of rope that were just hanging to the floor, I thought if I tie a knot in the bottom and that's just sort of just hanging off of the floor, I can then do pull-ups, jump down into dips, and then jump instantly down into suspended press-ups. So I took myself through a little circuit of, you know, like 10 pull-ups, 10 dips, 10 press-ups, bit of a rest, and back through again, Done, went through that five times, stood back, it, it gave me such a pump and such a feeling of a, a good workout. I thought that's a better workout than I've ever had on using the TRX or using the rings. And then that's what started the, the cogs whirring because I thought, right, there might be something in this. If I've had a better workout with a bit of rope and a plastic handle than I've ever had on any other product, there could be something here. So as I started thinking more and more, I thought, right, I've got to be serious about this because I can't patent a rope, a bit of deck rope and a plastic handle. There's nothing there to patent. And my head hurts thinking about it now. I don't know how, it was literally a moment of <laughs> madness, if you call it, I don't know. I, 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 dare I say genius, but um, yeah. the idea, yes. We came up with the idea <clears throat> for the handles to move, um, which of course is highly patentable. And we are granted in the UK and patent granted in the US as well. So wow. the playing field has been laid or the ground has, has been laid and it's, it's ready for us to start running on it. How long does it take to get the patent then? To, to get it, you know, to get it passed? <clears throat> Uh, quite a few years. So for us, it it took between uh, about three years, maybe just over wow. three years. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, quite a bit of money and quite a bit of time. Were you worried in that time that somebody else might not, you know, bring out the same idea? Ex ex extremely worried. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you, you, you just try and stick to... Uh, to the advice you get, you try and stick to, um, you know, the, the, the process that you feel is right. Um, it very much was difficult at, at times in regards to, we really want to try and get this out there and test the market. But because it's not protected, you know, how, how, how do we go about that? Because someone else, is, and it, you see it all of the time and, and history is, is peppered with accounts of bigger businesses seeing a, a good idea. Um, and these big businesses, they can do what we've done over the past four or five years with the um, prototype development. And I don't know if you can see them there. But that yes, the, the journey, the different um, prototypes that we had to have made up. You know, look at the state of that. Wow. <laughs> you know, it, it, so the different. The different prototype um, iterations that we had to go through until we until we finally got it right um, took took time and, and money, and uh, but the we, we kind of had to figure out the the, the balance of uh, sort of paralysis or paralysis by analysis. You know, not not overthinking it too much and not holding ourselves back, 
Um, but at the same time, you have got to be careful because sort of getting back to the point I was making is for a big established company, what took us a couple of years going for all of that prototype and they can do in months. Yeah, of course. Did you, did you have to keep it a secret then in, until you got the patent? Yeah, I, I got bored of asking people to sign NDAs and it even got to the point where I asked one of the business advisors, you know, do, do we actually need to keep doing this because it is becoming quite embarrassing? And strangely enough, a lot of people are actually quite adverse to it. And they're like, oh, well, I don't actually want to deal with you then if I've got to sign an NDA. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, we've got a unique product that we're looking to pattern. You know, all, all it does is protect from you stealing the idea. Uh, so actually, it didn't bother me too much because I thought, well, if you don't want to sign an NDA, you're not, you know, someone that I want to be speaking to anyway. But um, <clears throat> once we found the way of getting the funds to file the patent, um, when the patent is actually going through its pending phase, you're worldwide protected. It, 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 you, your protection only drops out if, you, if, if it doesn't sort of get oh, granted okay. the, the patent. But, yeah, so all the way through its pending stage, you're you are protected from from the time that you file it. But so it doesn't stop all your, people. All your stationery and your packaging has got to change from Pat's pending to patented at some point. To to granted, yeah, Grant, yeah. yeah. Well, luckily we're still at the stage where we haven't got, you know, a massive um, amount of of marketing or, or you know assets behind us in in that way and um, we, we are still very much growing um so yeah we're we're we're, we're it, that's not going to be too much of a headache to be honest yeah good stuff good stuff well listen tony we'll put links to where people can buy your product right the trainer yeah yeah, absolutely. BR BR 360, Battle Ready 360. Um, the SF1 Strength is a, 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 obviously you know a good place to go to 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 find out more. There's uh, promotional videos on there that give you a sense of, of of what the kit is and what it can do. That, that's a Facebook page, isn't it? SF1 Strength. Yeah, Facebook and Instagram. Okay. And then sf1strength.com is our landing page where you can plumb in your email <clears throat> and we'll, you know, you'll get updates. There is an apology, actually, that I want to put out to those that have already put in their email um, on the SF1 Strength website. We've, we are having uh, technical issues at the moment with sending out the, the welcome email to say thank you for signing up. Um, hopefully... You know, that's going to be sorted out within the coming weeks. But um, it's still, it still works in way of being able to put your details in. So I would still say if you want to, to, to find out more and be updated when there's new innovations, when there's other products coming out, um, then, yeah, please go to sf1strength.com and, and, and put your details in. It, it's just your email. Tony, listen. You've been absolutely amazing, mate. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, and mate, give us a bell I'm anytime. Still, I'm still wondering if you've got the right bloke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just want to say, though, you know, you can call me anytime, mate, if you want anyone to chat to about anything. And I, I know I can do that with you. And um, so to our to our um, friends yep. out there, don't struggle in silence. Reach out and, um, you know, the future is bright. You know, the future is bright. And uh, yes. So, Tony, just stay on the line. So that's, thank, thank you pro properly. But, but massive thank you again. I wish you all the luck um, with your venture and in life. To all our friends at home, massive love thank to you. you all. Take care. Thank you for tuning in. If you can like and subscribe and do all that kind of stuff, it's going to help us. And uh, we'll see you next time.